really excited for our event tonight. Um, I'm Shannon Vallum. I'll be your host this evening. Um, but first, we have a couple of announcements. Our first is from Morgan Sanford and Landon Graham, who are the president and vice president of Sigma Tau Delta. And right after that, we'll have an announcement from Tasha Urban about our broadside. Hey guys, I'm Landon, I'm the Vice President of Sigma Tau Delta. Um, just wanted to let you know we have our event, Poe in the Dark, coming up. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, uh, for one thing, Shannon has graciously agreed to be one of our faculty readers for that. Um, we are still trying to figure out the time and uh, place for that. Um, we wanted to make sure there are no conflicts because we expect to see all of the lovely people there. And, um, the Except there is a night during Helicon in which I'm reading, so don't go to the That's why, <laughs> that's that's why, why, that's why I mentioned. Uh, <laughs> I said, no, we can't conflict with Charles, and so we're definitely going to change that potentially to the Wednesday. <laughs> so we will uh, let you know <laughs> when we figure that out. However, um, we are holding auditions for um, our student readers, and so for all of you out there, talented students who would like to either read something of your own creative work or come um, and like if you have like a ghost story that you like it's that's kind of the theme is sort of like ghost stories or like scary things right Halloween all of that. so um, the auditions are going to be Tuesday the 17th um, from 6 to 9 in room 114 the Ravy West downstairs there and then um, if you can't make it to the audition but you would still really like to read and you should because it's going to be cool um, just talk to, uh, to Morgan and me and we can so, thanks guys. Woo! Yeah, okay, hello everyone. I'm Tasha Urban. I'm the one who's usually sketching in the back of these Holocon West meetings. It's because it helps me listen. Um, I'm also the um, editor for the broadsides now for Holocon West. So we have our new poster finally, um, and I'm really excited about it. It's, we've had this concrete poem for a long time. It's a concrete poem um, written after an interview with a B-29 bomber crew member veteran. And so the poem itself makes the bomber dropping the bombs. And we were really excited to get photography that worked with the poem. So if you have a chance, come and read it. Actually, there are three, so if you can't see, it's your own fault. <laughs> so take a look at that. And if you want to be considered to be featured on the Helicon West Broadsides, come talk to me. So, and if you, you want one of those, you can buy one for two bucks. What a deal. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tasha. Yeah. <laughs> And that poem is it's by Timothy, is it Peterson, Peterson or Peterson? Peterson? I just know him by Timothy. <laughs> Do you know Jennifer? Yeah. Uh, no. Not last <laughs> year. No, no, <laughs> yes. Um, and so he's a student at USU. Um, as you can see, there are, um, what are they called? Uh, surveys. <laughs> surveys on your chairs. Um, please keep a hold of those and fill those out and turn them in in the, in the back of the room at the conclusion of the event. Those will help um, the Utah Humanities Council to gather um, information and to continue to fund these awesome events. Um, so welcome once again to Helicon West. Thank you to Joseph Anderson and the Logan City Library for this great space. Also the USU Writing Center and Stark Holbrook who is the director of Helicon West and who is also our Logan City Poet Laureate. Woo. Yes, we can clap there. <laughs> As many of you know, we'll have an op open mic portion at the uh, end after our featured readings. And if you would like to sign up for that open mic, the sheet is in the back, and the limit is seven minutes of your original work. Um, okay, so this Helicon West event is part of the 20th annual Utah Humanities Book Festival. Through the generous work of Michael McLean and many others with the Utah Humanities, we get to interact with great authors like Jennifer and Rick. The book <clears throat> festival's major sponsors are the George S. and Dolora, Dolora Eccles Foundation, the R. Harold Burton Foundation, Chevron, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. There are many more book festival events. There are some newspapers back there where you can um, pick one up. They're all over the state. Stars Reading for One, 
um, next week, right, down in Springwood by Helper. Springwood by Helper. Um, and our next Helicon event will be um, our own Charles Waugh and Poet and poet Jonathan Travelstead. Um, and this is this will be our next event on October 26th here. So tonight we'll hear from poet Richard Robbins and um, creative nonfiction author, memoirist Jennifer Seiner. And after they read, we'll also have a short Q&A with the audience. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read their bios, but I first just want to say how, how wonderful both of these people are, how important both of them have been in my life in different stages. And I just really appreciate the goodness that they bring into this world and the support and the mentorship they've offered to so many students. Um, and their books are gorgeous. <clears throat> I forgot to bring Jennifer's letters, but I just thought it was quite fitting that they both have these wonderful images of water on the front. <laughs> um, they're beautiful. And I wanted to share with you also the special gift that Rick gave me recently, which I thought everybody would appreciate. <laughs> so thanks to both of you for just being such wonderful writers and wonderful people and just bringing such warmth into my life and the lives of so many people. We'll first start with Rick. I'll read his biography. I'll come up and read and then I'll come back up and introduce Jennifer. And then after Jennifer reads, I'll come back up and we will have a question and answer forum with the two authors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Richard Robbins was born in Los Angeles and grew up in Southern California in Montana. He has lived continuously in Minnesota since 1984. He has published five full-length books as well as the recent Body Turn to Rain, New and Selected Poems, which Lynx House Press released in May 2017. Over the years, he's received awards and fellowships from The Loft, the McKnight Foundation, the Minnesota State Arts Board, the Hawthorne and Castle International Retreat for Writers, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Poetry Society of America. From 1986 to 2014, Robbins directed the Good Thunder Reading Series at Minnesota State University Mankato, where he continues to direct the creative writing program. In 2006, he was awarded the K. Sexton Award for longstanding dedication and outstanding work in fostering books, reading, and literary activity in Minnesota. Welcome to Rick. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Shannon. That's our, uh, it's, the bio said that I've lived uh, continuously in Minnesota for 34 years, and, and that's true. And that what that means is that I've missed living in the West for 34 years. Um, so who knows, maybe I'll get out here again at some point. So this is a new and selected poems, which means that uh, there's 90 poems in here from five previous books, and then there's 40 new poems, uh, which I, I, so I won't read them all tonight. Uh, but it means, it means it's a real doorstop, so if you need a doorstop, uh, they're on sale. <laughs> um, and I'm going to set my clock, so it'll be very good. There we go. Okay. Um, so, I'll just uh, launch into, uh, so I'll read, I'll read some new ones, mostly new ones, but a couple of old ones too, maybe. Uh, this one's called Turpentine. Sometime try forgetting the roar of melted glacier falling over stone toward whispering cities in the basin, or a wad of paper flaring in an ashtray, or in the hearth, the woods, the ash level rushing to meet flame beneath the teepee made of sticks, the wind's language launched at heaven. Sometime try forgetting the leg as it broke, quiet knuckle, or the melon thump that day a speeding biker died into the curb, or the silence all around him and home. Sometimes smell, sometimes taste the last bite of fish and watch how it leaves you each time you swallow wine or breathe. What if her hand on your hand, still warm and floating only half its weight now all these years since the day, what if that weight 
dissolved fast as the taste of herbs on carrots? What if the eye, having called it to mind, had descended away for good? Her hand banished to the place memory never reaches again. His voice calls you to the creek, sage smell like turpentine and high desert. Then the small tug from the world underwater, the reeling, the flashing, coming your way, its dance across royals, its breading each side of itself on the sand. Sometime try forgetting what you know. So the house that uh, I grew up in in Los Angeles uh, <coughs> had a formal dining room uh, with its own doors. and Everything in there was very mahogany and dark. And, and we only really ate in there on Easter and Thanksgiving and Christmas. So it was kind of a mysterious room. Had a lot of um, ancient uh, ancestors in sepia photographs on the wall. And uh, so this is uh, about that room, among other things, I guess. Old Country Portraits. My lost sister used to try the trick with the tablecloth, waiting until the wine had been poured, the gravy boat filled, before snapping the linen her way, smug as a matador, staring down silver and crystal that would dare move, paying no mind to the ancestor gloom gliding across the wallpaper like clouds of a disapproving front. No hutch or bureau spared, no lost sister sure the trick would work this time, all those she loved in another room, nibbling saltines, or in the kitchen, plating the last of the roast beef. How amazed they would be to be called to the mahogany room for supper, to find something missing, something beautiful finally, they could never explain. The wine twittering in its half globes, candles aflutter, each thing in its place, or it's so it seemed then, even though their lives had changed for good. Um, I have a friend who uh, is a physicist, and uh, he retired a couple years ago, but he taught for many years at uh, Cal Poly in Pomona. And so I told him, I said, John, I finally wrote a poem about that, that's about science. I wrote about you know the Higgs boson particle. <laughs> Um, and then I read him this poem, and he said, uh, no, you didn't write it. <laughs> so, um, so you be the judge. God particles. They show up after a death, arranging a face on the shroud. They make the waterfall fall. They make the shine in Whitman's eye, the flies in orbit around the hungry. Under the Alps, they lose the recent race to protons. They make grilled peach halves over strawberry, the drizzle of honey. They make that hand, one finger over another. Under the Alps, they make the six-legged horse just over a rise, coming this way, bearing down. Uh, when, when we lived in Montana, we lived uh, up in the nor northwestern Montana, not too far away from Glacier Park. And uh, we, you know, rarely went to Glacier Park unless we had visiting, you know, family and they wanted to go to Glacier Park. And if it was on Sunday, it would be an extremely long ordeal of going to church and then going to brunch and then heading up to the, to the, the pass and then somebody wanted, would want to take the long time back, long way back and, and um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, We'd leave at 8 in the morning and get back at 6 in the afternoon, and everybody would be mad at each other. But, but one of the features of the day trip was um, you know, taking your glass with you and putting it under a glacier you know, and drinking the ice water there. Nobody worried about Giardia or anything you know, about back then. Um, so those of you that have been to Glacier Park know this, but there's one highway that runs through it, and it's called Going to the Sun Highway. Without fear, we parked the car on the thin bulge beside the cliff and crossed to where the glacier filled our Mickey Mouse or elbow tap room pints, whatever we had brought to taste what came out of the sky ten, a hundred years before. If it was Sunday, we'd gone to mass in Kalispell, then brunched at the Jordan Cafe where a waiter, regardless of group or size, memorized the order. 
We'd driven north through narrowing gorges to the park, then up the U-shaped valley on going to the sun, the long, slow string peppered with rockfall, slicked with melt toward Logan Pass. Fifty years now, and the family can't remember grizzly prints or eagles plucking char from Lake McDonald, only the forgiven carload, dozy from the road, renewed by the body and blood of Christ, restored by breakfast, slaking its thirst in a field of scree, the water cold as we'd ever known, a taste simple as granite, the sun beating on us at 6,000 feet, and a waterfall being born under our shoes, crossing its first of four borders before it died a thousand miles from there in the sea. <coughs> um, one of the places that I lived in Southern California <coughs> was, uh, excuse me, was a little, it was about an hour south of Los Angeles. And, and when we lived there in the mid-60s, the 60s through the 70s, um, you know, you never saw anybody famous there. You know, you were, you know, Hollywood, even it was a mile, uh, it was an hour away, it might as well have been on the moon. So if you did see somebody famous, you know, it would like, be a really big deal. And, um, and so when I was 12, you know, I was in the grocery store shopping line and this vaguely familiar guy was behind me. And, um, and uh, when we got closer to the, to the, uh, the register, he just, he met, his, his eyes met the, the clerk and he went, Arr! and I realized it was the wolf man. It was, uh, it was Juan Cheney Jr. Uh, and I didn't know he lived near me, but, uh, but then I did. Um, so, um, so, so I'm going to read the poem about that, about that in a moment, and um, that's from a book called uh, "Famous Persons We Have Known," which has you know sort of celebrities at the beginning of the book, and then sort of anonymous people at the end of the book. And I might read one of the ones at the end. Lon Chaney Jr. at the supermarket in Capistrano Beach. You'd see them now and then on the fringe of their stardom. Dick Van Dyke, for instance, sober at last after his show dissolved. Mostly they aged well, in chinos and golfers tan, not a mark out of the ordinary except for the two white teeth, where they carried the torque of who they were and no longer were in a kind of walking hammerlock, plain Bob Denver eating steak in surgeon's garb at the El Adobe. You'd wonder why that woman in a fox stole, walking her hound, could look at you once, all of 12 years old, and convince you to be her grandson forever. Did you recognize who cast the spells? Would they someday reveal themselves like the gray man behind you at checkout, shuffling forward with all of us, quiet, eyeing his eggs for cracks and counting his milk? heaping bananas high against the night curse of leg cramps. Just as the clerk turns our way, he straightens up at the gum rack and growls, paws half raised and bared, and the eyes, the terrible eyes, wide and red and old, relaxing now into all our delight. <laughs> so I'm gonna read um, the last poem from that book, and it's kind of sad but I promise that I will follow it with something irreverent. <laughs> so I'll take you down into the valley, and I hope I don't get you. Uh, or maybe you won't think it's in the, yeah, you'll, it is sad. Somebody dies. <clears throat> but, um, but the idea was that, so, you know, there are people in our lives, you know, like we see in the movies and we see on TV, and they're celebrities, and, and you know, or maybe they're musicians and they're celebrities that way. And they, you know, they touch us in certain ways, and in really important ways. So, sometimes too. But then we have these people in our lives who are basically anonymous uh, to everyone else, but they're the most central people in our lives. You know, we're related to them or, or they have uh, some other powerful effect on us. So this is about, you know, those, those people. Uh, this is called Bread. The day we heard about her cancer, the kind in the brain and lungs, whatever that means, the longest cold spell of winter slipped away like short-term memory, now to the surface and quietly over a set of falls, down to a river silent and out of view. 
Each warmer day dazed us with sun. My wife shoveled her walk five doors west. I made them potato rolls. And among women, a chain of prayer extended all over town. Looking for my friend, I wanted to touch him on the shoulder, that gateway to another grief, just to ask what he needed. I thought only of that exchange, what I would say not to fumble, and I guessed his jaded, grateful answer. I guessed the humor there. But it never worked that way. Both of them simply disappeared into the shrinking of tumors, into managing pain, that escape in slow drives between city and town that took them by cow fields, brick barns, any reminder of France. She was cold and hot all at once those days, so they'd fidget with the fan all the way back from the doctors, tires on wet road like bacon sizzling, my friend asleep a lot of the time. When they talked, it was not like in the movies. I now know this all third hand, but what you need to understand is that in two months, she went from fear to desire, he from fear to love. They let go into loneliness, knowing it part of the orbit. I only found this out later. What I did those months was find signs everywhere, in the weather, the start of Lent, my cough, every gesture of hers before I'd heard, the air, the soil. On Ash Wednesday evening, the church was her body we lived and sang to fill. Black pressed the stain out of glass. I ate and drank from her, our mutual sacrifice. There are times in your life when you feel inside great unspeakable mystery. It makes you tremble. That is the sign. There are other times, growing your own grief, when you force an utter sense on the world. I never cared for her the way I thought I did. She left my galaxy, my river with its talking stones. Am I unkind to say this? I am. I talk like someone who will die alone. I don't really know what desire or love, the roles for leavers and stayers, Every time that lake comes back in memory, though, the ice long gone, the sun high, hot, salmon biting at any color or flash, the world composes itself exponentially around the meal appearing, as I say it, on picnic tables at the end of this great day. Everyone I've ever cared for is here. We complain about the hornets. We wonder about the cold breeze out of Canada. And all of us praise the fish, the whole spread two grandparents made because feeding the hungry is what it's always all about. No one has died yet, although I know they will. They are feeding us, even as they leave. They are inside of us, kneeling and singing. They break us and tear from within as if we were bread. They help us turn new into the life we didn't know was already here. So, let's take a drink of water. I think I have time for about two more. This next one uh, that I promised you is uh, a little longer, too. Um, I know it has a sticky note to it. There it is. Okay. So, I used to work with a guy who was the most negative person I've ever worked with. He just hated everything. Um, you know, if you said the sky was blue, you know, well, it could have been bluer, you know. Um, or, um, or, you know, this good thing happened to me. Oh, yeah, I know, nothing ever good happens to me. And um, so uh, he was a really fun guy to channel in this book. Um, so just, you know, basically someone who hates everything. Um, so this is called The Odds. Finally, it turns out, he was against everything. <laughs> against six-year-olds with baseball gloves and red caps. Against Jack Russell Terriers, Mustangs, Beatles. Against chocolates after dinner, three-hour movies. Against movies without plot or their bastard cousin film. <laughs> he marched against terror in Asia and chained himself to the White House fence. 
He wrote essays against polluted thought. He practiced body painting like Farrah Fawcett, all to oppose losing one's mind in public. He fought pasta at every meal. He fought cloves and ham. He fought the shrinking size of ice cream tubs. He'd slice off an ear if Pee Wee Herman would just stay off the news. He was against taxes, big government, no government, any manner of clown from dog catcher to secretary of defense, against voting except to vote against, against freedom, tyranny, against love. He'd never been damaged as a child. If he had, he'd still be against therapy. He was against his own best judgment, against himself. Who could trust anyone so close? <laughs> Long ago, he decided he who was not with him was against him. He was against most everyone. He did not kick against the pricks, but that didn't mean he was for them. He was against factory farming, animal testing, GMOs, the WTO, bow hunting the deer in Rasmussen Woods, gill nets, whaling, seal hunts, against wearing fur, against leather, against meat, against Coke, Nestle, and Honeywell, against every smart-ass Indian tobacco-smoking vegan wearing petrochemical fleece. <laughs> he was against even walking. On the trail by his house, deep in an oak savanna, he growled at the smallest rodents and cursed the cardinal's cheap tune. He was equally against poison ivy and grass. If a bald eagle swooped on him, he would argue with its feathers. He was against the voice of God in the creek, the constant nagging of angels to go deeper into wild. His feet took him places he would never believe in. They were compass needles answering a greater pull. He was against the North and South Poles. He was against the fascist years of Pound, the suicide of Plath, the dissipation of Dylan Thomas and Jackson Pollock, John Cage's silence, the dead weight of Soviet realism, new criticism, post and neo-modernism, against the hegemony of text, against the pimps of dark art and self-immolation, against beauty, he made the poem that rebuked them. He was against the vowel shift and most contractions. He was against lemon zesters, calamari, the execution of Mata Hari, Harry Potter, fizzy water, laughter, Daffy Duck, Chuck Norris, Doris Day singing anything related to Christmas, Miss Manners, <laughs> Ann Landers, Gander Mountain, Rin Tin Tin, Cheap Rhyme, Your Mother. <laughs> he was against the sun coming up and going down, or rather the earth turning, or rather the way time gets into the act, or rather the idea of history like too much loose change in a threadbare pocket, or rather your mother who sold us all down river in 1862. He was against everything finally, even the patience of, of his wife, who really should have kicked his butt, <laughs> even his dog who continued to snuggle his shoe, even the forgiving mirror, the soft couch of his living room, against even John Coltrane, God bless him, against even blessing. What would it take to love something again? A dream of thunder and lightning, a newborn looking up into his eyes, He'd be against that too, rocking and rocking his little package, the neighborhood speeding by outside the window. Given their odds, given the little song he keeps the baby quiet with, he'd bet against it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have five seconds left to read. Um, so I'm going to read you. Uh, I'm going to read you. I used to do what you did for 28 years, you know, where you stand up here and after a long day you don't really know if you can even put a sentence together. <laughs> so I, I, um, so I got up here once and I said, like, welcome for coming. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I got a lot of uh, grief about it, but I got a poem out of it. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, and it's only like six, six lines long, and I know it's here. It doesn't have a post-it note. Well, there it is. Yeah, so this is called aphasiac. Welcome for coming. <laughs> Please be advised along the rails of the guided ship. The first of every month, and you were the smartest one. Out of the heavens spun above us, just like that. The liver throbbed, a basket of lilies, a garbage-filled cathedral. Please sit yourself home. We have only begun the cave wall blooming finally with animals.
Thank you. <laughs> Um, both of our authors have books for sale in the back and they will sign them, so make sure to go and buy a book or two or three or four before you leave today. Um, <clears throat> we have another event coming up next week on Thursday, a week from today. Um, Star Colebrook, our Logan City po Poet Laureate, will be having a walkabout and that is um, also, uh, in conjunction with the National Federation of the Blind, the Cash Valley Chapter, and in honor of May Swenson. And so if you're interested in that, we'll be meeting on Thursday, October 19th at 5.20 p.m. in the USU English Department, um, May Swenson Room, is that correct? Okay, May Swenson Room. And then we'll be walking over to the library, is that correct? Okay, so here's the flyer, and I'll put this on the back. Um, so you can check that out if you're interested. We also have the poetry, or excuse me, the Helicon West Anthology. Um, many people in this room are published in our Helicon West Anthology, which is a 10-year celebration of our featured readers at this event. And it includes, um, you know, our, our famous writers and, and also our wonderful student writers as well. I don't know, do we have some of these for sale, Star? Yeah, they're 15 and you can get them in the back. Okay, $15. And, and since lots of authors are here, you can say, who's, who's in this? And we'll come and sign it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is now my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Seiner. Um, Jennifer is the author of three books, most recently Letters Like the Day on Reading Georgia O'Keeffe, which was published by New Mexico in 2017, and also Ordinary Trauma, a memoir published by the U of U um, in 2017. So two books in one year. We're very proud of Jennifer. Um, her essays have appeared in numerous places, including The American Scholar, Utney, Creative Nonfiction, and Gulf Coast. The recipient of the stipend in American Modernism, as well as nominations for the National Magazine Award and the Pushcart Prize. Jennifer teaches creative writing at Utah State University, where she's a professor of English. She lives here in Logan with um, poet Michael Souter, another of our wonderful faculty, and her two sons. So welcome to me. Thanks to Shannon for that beautiful introduction, and thanks to Star for hosting the evening, and thanks to all of you for being out here and for um, showing up for writing and for art, and especially for showing up tonight. It fills my heart to see so many familiar faces, and I feel so much love for all of you. I feel very honored to have read with Rick tonight, and I appreciate his presence and his poetry. It's a beautiful way to start the evening. So I am going to read um, from Ordinary Trauma tonight. Uh, it is a memoir that is a series of linked flash nonfiction pieces, so it's easy for me to read from because the pieces are all fairly short. Um, I'm going to start in the middle of one of them, and then I'm going to go to the next one, and I'm going to finish with one more. Um, there's a little bit you need to know. I grew up in a military family. My dad was in, in the Navy, so we moved around a lot, and I had two brothers. And in the first part of the book that I'm going to read tonight, the first part I'm reading, I'm eight. My brother Scott is about five. Um, and my little brother Brian is uh, not quite two. And we are in the above ground swimming pool in uh, Virginia. So an above ground pool, I don't even know if they make them anymore, but they're these big pools where they're these big sides. And we would have to climb up onto a deck that my dad built in order to jump into the pool. Then I'll move back in time when my uh, brother Scott is about <coughs> two or three and I'm about five and my little brother is not born yet. And then I'll return to this scene. So I think that's all you need to know. Okay, so I'm starting in the middle of things. My brother Scott and I are playing at the pool and we're jumping through these inner tubes. I jump through the stack Scott has piled for me and hit the icy water. 
the rubber burns my upper arms where I miscalculated and the stack falls. You made them wobbly, I cry, when I come to the surface. I can see the red welts forming already. They match the marks on my legs. The phone's ringing. My mother says I'll be right back. I don't watch her walk the 20 yards to the house, past the beetle-infested roses, and climb the patio stairs, open the screen door, and enter the cool of the dining room. I am not there when she picks up the phone and greets Diane's mother, who is called to complain about the construction at the naval yard. Brian, that's my littlest brother. Brian remains on the pool deck. He throws each acorn to the ground below, pulls leaves from twigs. When it's my turn to jump through the tires, I stand only inches from where he sits on the wooden planks near my feet. I call Scott a cheater and threaten to stack my own tubes. My mother remains in the house, perhaps wrapping the extra long telephone cord around her body as she talks, every now and then trying to find a line of sight through the picture window to the pool. But she can't get the angle. She can't find her children. So she doesn't see the moment when Brian topples into the pool. She doesn't see his arms flail, fingers grab at the, bull, at the blue plastic edge. She doesn't see him sink to the bottom, pulled by a diaper filled with water like a weight. Nor do I. He plummets, settles on the bottom, face up, blonde hair waving like a water nymph's. Having set my own stack of tires, balancing the blisters, fitting the rubber together like a puzzle, I climb the ladder to the deck and prepare for my jump. It is then that I see him, splayed like a frog against the bright blue bottom of the pool. His body shimmers under the water, the edges blurred, as if he has already begun to dissolve into the next world. This is how he sleeps, face up, arms thrown back, welcoming the night because he knows the worst thing he will ever face has already happened. Unlike me who curls into a ball, blankets covering every inch of exposed flesh, afraid of the dark and monsters and being left alone, he could be napping. I don't yell to Scott. I don't say anything because I am consumed by the knowledge that I was the one left in charge. And I can't die four feet to pull his body from the water. Even if I could bring him to the surface, I don't know how to save him. The fallen tires bump against the edges of the pool. Leaves gather on the surface. I begin to scream. 23, the video. One evening at Hospital Point, in the weeks before the movers would come to pack us out and take our household goods across the Pacific to Virginia, my father suggested we watch home movies. The dishes were done, the laundry folded, the items on my mother's invisible list crossed off for the day. It'll be fun, my father said, already headed for the closet that held the film projector. My mom sat on the couch, her feet tucked beneath her, her needlepoint tipped toward the lamp for better light. Scott, almost three, played with his trucks on the floor. I watched my mother pull the purple thread through the canvas. A few days earlier, I'd asked her what she was making with all those shades of purple. A sampler, she had told me. And I nodded, though I had no clearer picture of what the needlepoint would become. I did know that once the sampler was finished, another project would take its place, hemming my skirt, patching Scott's pants, ironing the stiff creases into my father's uniform. My mother's hands never stilled. I imagined even in sleep they kept moving, perhaps refiguring the checkbook that always left her frustrated or needing another loaf of bread. If we did watch a home movie that night, my mother would see very little of it. My father set the projector on the dining room table and told me to find pillows for the floor. The military white walls made a sheet unnecessary. It also meant that geckos and the occasional cockroach would make guest appearance on the screen. What should we watch, my father asked. He turned to my mother, but I was the one who responded. My birthday, my birthday, I cried, abandoning the shadow puppets on the wall and hurrying to his side. The breeze from the harbor filled our tiny living room, vibrating the Venetian lines. Most of the movies were from my father's childhood, grainy films of boys chasing one another around picnic tables piled high with Tupperware, or movies from dinner parties where guest after guest held, ha held half, glass, half full glasses to the camera and cheered the lens. My father glanced at my mother, who merely shrugged her shoulders mid-stitch. Your birthday it is, he said. The bright white 
of the bright square of white was replaced by the scratch and blur of film being loaded. I sprawled on the floor, my head on a cushion, and listened to the click of the projector as it moved the film forward. Nothing. Black scratches, white light, then nothing. Then thread-like lines, then black, then nothing. Then, my one-year-old self, sitting in a high chair, pigtails sprouting like fireworks from both sides of my head. There I am, I cried. Though I felt no sense of recognition or connection between the girl on the screen before me and the one I understood myself to be, I couldn't have said for sure it was my mother. The woman who hovered near my high chair, hair piled in some kind of crazy bouffant with a white headband holding it all back. The woman wore pearls like my mother sometimes did, but the woman on film smiled more freely. Or maybe she didn't smile more, but rather when she did smile it seemed like the natural resting expression for her face, the pauses between smiles becoming the oddity. I looked at my mother now, craning her body toward the light in the even darker room my father had insisted on for the movie. Damn it, my mother said softly, putting her finger to her mouth to suck. Then she resumed her needlework, and I imagined a drop of blood on the deep purple thread woven into the sampler, known only to the two of us. There you are, my father cried, and look at you. Look at what you're doing with that cake. What I was doing was repairing my cake, chocolate cake, one my mother had made with two even layers of frosting that shone even on film. I had taken the first bite, maybe the first two or five or ten, and then, noticing the holes made by my greedy hands, I had gone about repairing the damage, mushing the cake crumbs back to the cake, smoothing over the frosting. What a girl, my father said, his bourbon refilled, the ice clinking in the glass. The damaged cake magically repaired under my one-year-old hands and in front of my five-year-old eyes. So by the end, I was sitting above a perfectly formed cake, clapping my hands, the candles now relit. When the film finished, I asked to see it again, delighting in my ability to fix the cake, my intelligence, my cleverness. And for once, my father didn't argue, didn't criticize, didn't ration joy like flour. He played it again and then again, so that when we had finished, the night was certain and dark, stars bright above the inky black harbor. Only recently did I learn that my father had been playing the film backwards, a fact that seems as obvious now as it was magical then. Again and again, my father would wind the film and hit reverse. The story of a girl who lived her life carefully, a lie. I'd eat my cake with the abandon of every other one-year-old. Somewhere inside me lives the girl who couldn't stand to see the ugliness of a mess, the insides of her cake exposed and crumbling. A daughter of the military, she believes order and regulation will defeat evil and disarray. She will never leave crumbs on the counter and will always turn off the lights. 24, the mask. My mother stands on the deck with Brian in her hands. All around us, the crows caterwaul in the trees, competing with the traffic to see who can fill the air with sound. Down the street, a lawnmower comes on and then cuts off almost immediately. I hear a semi braking at the stoplight, gears downshifting in the squeal of hot brakes. My mother doesn't hold Brian to her chest, but rather to the sky, offering her son to the crows, the clouds, the errant leaf. Water rushes from her t-shirt, my brother's diaper, his hair. It streams in channels that pour through the boards at the deck, hitting the hard red clay and spattering the white sides of the pool with red. Still, holding him to the sky, she screams, something fierce and deep, a sound that renders every other word ever made a whisper. Oh God, she sobs. Oh my God, no, no, no. Offering his body on an altar of air, she calls again and again to the clouds, while the trees all around us hold the scene like a globe, a world that's been shaken. My mother learned to scuba dive in Hawaii, is trained in CPR, first aid, the specific strategies you employ to save someone whose lungs have filled with water, but she does not press his chest or clear his throat, does not put her mouth to his. Confused, I stand by the pile of red dirt, caught in a world that no longer makes sense, where brothers drown and mothers wail and daughters forget to watch. I'll call dad, I shout. Instead of answering me, she bends over my brother, still unable to put him down. Forming a half bench on her knees, she begins to press his chest. I think of my father miles away, deep in the belly of the Pentagon, shuffling papers and talking to his secretary, unaware of what is unfolding in his own backyard. He should know what is happening. He could do something. He knows how to fix everything, has every tool possible hanging from the pegboard in his workshop. I'll call dad, I yell again. 
And this time she hears me because she turns towards me and looks surprised to see that she is not alone in this hell. Go to the Walters, call 911. No, Dad, I say, heading to the house. He is the only one who can make this okay. The Walters, call 911. Only much later will I realize that I am too young to call the ambulance on my own. I have let my brother drown, but I can't reach the kitchen phone without the heavy stool. The wind picks up and carries away the possibility of my father saving us. I run to the neighbors, leaving my mother holding my brother limp in her arms. Through sheer force of will, my mother will suck the chlorinated water from Brian's lungs and keep him in this world. The ambulance will be returned to the hospital and my mother will keep Brian close. When he sleeps in her arms, he will look exactly as he did under the water, face soft, edges blurred, eyelashes still in quiet. And here is what gives me pause all these many years later. We will wait for my father to come home. Wait to hear his heels hit the stone pathway to tell him. In doing so, it will be clear to me that this day, this event, this moment is not exceptional. It didn't even warrant a phone call. We will keep all of this, the wailing, the water, the boy blurring into the next world, under control. I'm home, my father calls as he opens the front door. Scott and I sit in the living room under strict orders not to utter a word. My mother holds Brian at the, di my mother holds Brian at the dining room table. Place settings tidy, water glasses already filled. Perhaps she is not called in because she wants to share the story with the evidence of a good ending in her arms. Hey guys, my father says when he moves past the bamboo, bamboo screen and sees us in the living room floor. I brought you something. He holds a plain brown bag in his hands, the kind from the military exchange, and offers it to us. Thanks, Dad, we chorus glancing toward my mother. Is it okay to take a present on a day your youngest brother almost dies? There are two of you, so you can each have one, no fighting over colors. He moves toward the stairs, already unbuttoning his uniform. How was your day, he asks my mom. Inside the brown paper bag are two masks and snorkels, one blue and one red. Even at that age, I understand the irony as I place the mask against my face and imagine an underwater world. In the kitchen, my parents draw close to the sink under the only window in the room, and my mother tells my father how his son almost died that day. I am sure she takes the blame for all of it, has no idea that I am already carrying my own suitcase of guilt. I imagine my father holds both my mother and brother closely, says comforting words, but he will never fully understand. He has never heard my mother scream so loudly that the crowd, that the crows are sent flying. He has never seen his son blur at the edges. Perhaps she skips the part about the pleading with the sky or the way Brian's body was made heavy by the diaper even though all the life had drained from him. Maybe she doesn't show him the deep scrape in her side where she brushed against the boards on the deck as she ran to her son. I don't know what they say to each other. Their murmurs lap into the living room and collect in the lamplight where they surround Scott and me who hold new masks in our hands. Outside, in the long summer evening, birds return to their nests and the sky begins to quiet down. Thank you. that? Do you say, hey, I'm writing a story about you or a poem about you and get permission? Or do they, do you have to seek out some kind of approval? What are, what's the kind of the ethical process you have to go through with that? Because I know you write about your family and you write about people that you know, so how do you 
do that? Uh, I don't ask permission. <laughs> um, I mean, if it ever, I, but then I, I, I don't think I breach anybody's privacy either. I mean, my, my memory of people uh, belongs to me. And, um, and I have compared some memories uh, with my sister, and oftentimes, you know, they have entirely different recollections. But, um, no, but I, I mean, I don't write with any malice towards anybody, but, um, and I can understand how maybe somebody might be put off by something that I said about them, but I don't start with that, you know, yeah. yeah. I own my imagination, I hope. I don't ask permission either, but I think it um, varies from writer to writer. I've also heard people. Has, has your family responded well to your memoir? Because it's beautifully written. Um, my parents are really proud of me. That's what I'll say. That almost hurts worse. Yes. My dad, I don't think, has read it. Um, so, Jennifer. I know form is really important to you, and I know you teach the, the braided essay routinely because I feel like it, it, it means something to you to, to write in this way and to, to find the answer when the braids all come together. And I'm curious if in writing these flash pieces, if you at all started to think of them as braids and whether that's different in a way than you would, con yeah, than you would think of a braided essay. Um, so it's not quite the same thing, I don't think, because with a braided essay, you really are working with these three very different strands. And here, it's, I do write about my father's childhood and largely about my own childhood. But I did um, not follow a chronological line. There's a general chronological line. I'm generally getting older in the book. But I also move back and forward in time um, just uh, to play with that idea that um, we like to think of time in linear ways, but it's really much more layered our experience of it. Mm -hmm. So did you find that there was some other, since it's about chron chronology that's leading you to organize them, did you find there was some other register? Is this like, a, are you thinking of like a mixtape where you have to mm -hmm. kind of think of like something that's got yeah. some humor and something that's got something deeper or more troubling? Well, like, or? even in the thing I read tonight, I mean, that was really intentional to move back to Hospital Point there, because I think that I'm trying to figure out why I felt so, I mean, I was eight. I was clearly not responsible for my brother almost drowning in the pool. I can see that as an adult. When my child was eight, I was like, holy cow, I cannot believe that at that age, I would assume that kind of responsibility. But I did. I very, very much and definitely felt very responsible for what happened that day. So then casting back even further, bringing in that clip from um, watching that video and just thinking about how important it was for me to see myself in a certain way and the cost of that, the cost of that. If, if the two of you could just move Inward. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> if, if you're in front of the painting, then you're fine. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't think about that. You, the audio was getting caught, so we're good. But. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about your your poem. The, you gave an introduction that kind of explained where you're coming from, and then you're going to move back in time, and you're going to, you know, and it helped. It was it was beautiful, by the way. Um, but I'm just curious, do you expect the readers to capture this, this movement in time through the poem without that explanation? I guess the same for any, any poem. You, know, you, you gave explanations for yours, but, yeah. uh, but without that kind of a background, uh, do the poems, are they as meaningful to the readers? Oh, well, probably not. I, I mean, you know, um, you have to come here to get that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I mean I, you want them to be self-contained. You want them to have a sort of a, a life on their own if somebody's, you know, by themselves reading them. But, um, but I mean, I think the writer is always going to have a different relationship to his or her work than 
the reader is going to have. You want, you know, I, I want to feel like I came close to that poem in my head that I was writing, uh, but I also want there there to have been created some access for an audience. Now, you, you know, but I'm not going to, but I don't think you know, an audience needs like the whole backstory of my life, you know, to because what you're what you're often trying to do in a poem is is to capture a kind of a moment and uh, you know a kind of a shimmer, you know, and it's never going to have the backstory with it, but if, if, if the audience can get, and I mean the reader, not just the audience, but, but if the reader can get a little bit of the shimmer, then I think that's enough, you know, or that's, you're lucky if you can get that. Yeah. Is that answering your question? Same for you. Yeah. I'm thinking about moving around in time and context. Yeah, how many do you expect the reader to capture? Well, I think it's the, the best kind of writing is the kind that um, withstands multiple readings. And so um, as the reader sits with the piece longer, the more theoretically should unfold. So in class I talk about leaving little chocolate chips. And so the, the reader starts to see the little chocolate chips and it starts to magnify and become more meaningful. But no, I don't. The work should be able to stand on its own without any kind of context around it. But it should also open out uh, as you read deeper and deeper and sit with it longer. Theoretically, that's what should happen. That feels like it does. It does. So, thanks. Thank you. That's a very good question, Maya. The question was whether I remembered on my own or if I asked about it. I did not ask anybody about it. Um, if uh, they remember things much differently than how I remembered them, and um, I didn't ask them about it, I guess because I wanted to hold on to the memory as I remembered it, and I wanted it to be. I think the thing about memory and recalling those past moments is that regardless of whether that memory is true in any kind of factual sense, the way you recall it says a lot about who you are. And that's what a memoirist has to figure out, is why are they remembering what they're remembering? It doesn't actually matter so much what it actually is that you remembered, but why did you remember it that way? I often in my book remember myself as being alone a lot. Probably I wasn't alone that often, but I felt like I was alone a lot. So did you like, remember everything all at once, and then you just decided to write this book? No, that's the thing. That's the magic about writing, is you start writing about it, and it starts coming back. Mm -hmm. You know, you start to write about it, you remember more and more, and one memory begets another memory, and one scene creates another scene, and it becomes this whole, you re-inhabit your life. It's pretty amazing. Though that the other thing about that is that it's kind of um, you. One of a writer named Dave Egger says it's kind of a, a cannibalism because once you set the memory down, you can't remember it any other way. So I can't remember outside of the way I've written that story. There's no way for me to get outside it and think something else might have happened because it's now set in stone. So you're kind of cannibalizing your past. In the most productive of ways. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, along those same lines, if you uh, set that, you know, you get my more down, and then didn't read it for a year, and then tried to start again, you think it would come out pretty much the same? You mean if I wrote it one way, then stepped away, and tried to start blank page all over again, would it be the same way? I sort of think it would. I mean, there might be more things that I could recall, maybe, but at least for me, once it's down, it's pretty fixed. And I actually recently read something, um, there's a new book out called The Survivor Cafe about trauma and the way it gets handed down, and, and she's a daughter of parents who survived the Holocaust, and she suggests that, that any, as soon as memory gets articulated at all, it's, it's no longer, it's uh, already adulterated and already uh, a fixed country. Uh, 
Wait, um, your, your poem about the, the guy who's against everything, um, <coughs> I think it works so well because the list is believable. It's mm -hmm. sort of coherent, <laughs> but it's not a cliche. And I'm wondering how you came up. I assume maybe a few of those were, were real, actual memories, but then a lot of it's imagined. And did you like come up with 500 and then boil it down to 50, or <laughs> did one lead to another, kind of the way Jennifer was talking about? Or I, I do you remember how that came well, about at all? I, I, I think that poem, I was just kind of riding a wave. I mean, I was, I was just channeling this guy. And, and some of those things uh, were not things that he actually said, but they were the kind of things that he might say. And of course, I, I mean, I exaggerated too. I mean, he's a very nice guy. He's a very <laughs> solid citizen and, you know, he, he, and, uh, but, um, but uh, yeah, but I think I was just, uh, and it's not as if I wrote it all in one draft, but but, uh, or, you know, or that it was all done in one draft. But I do remember getting a substantial draft out uh, when I started, just because there was a kind of a, a wave there, you know, a kind of an energy, I guess. And then, you know, in the middle of that, you're trying to mix up sort of, you know, high and low and sarcastic, but sort of serious, and, you know. I have a question about the poem about the guy who's a lot of different shapes over a really long time. I was wondering if you could talk about that because the form is so interesting and like chronologically how it sort of is chronological and how it unfolds. What was it like when you first started the project and how did it change? Well, Michael will testify <laughs> to the fact that it, it took lots of different forms and it was a really long process to write it. So part of it I really, literally did start writing 20 years ago, but a lot of it is, is a more recent, meaning 10 years. So it's like, it's a long time. And it took a long time to find its form, but that's the thing about book-length work, and it's, I think, true for a poetry collection as well, is that the structure is everything, and the structure is very hard to find. I feel like, for me, it has to arise organically from the work, and so I began with a linear kind of narrative because that's the kind of narrative we privilege, especially in memoir. You know, I think we, and that really failed. I felt like that uh, didn't really work. And um, I, you know, it took so many different versions. There was a moment where it was collections, like small essays. There was that moment, so it was like linked essays. And then finally I realized that it needed to be pieces of flash because it needed to pile up on the um, reader. That's the feeling I want to generate. It's one experience of ordinary trauma after the other. And so, um, because that's how it felt. And so that, the form ended up, hopefully the idea is to inundate. The other way it works is that it's, the titles of the pieces are all very boring. The mask, the video, the phone call, these ordinary things. But then trying to draw attention to the fact that the ordinary is sometimes not ordinary. Sometimes it is. Um, I have a question for Rick. Mm -hmm. um, Two-part question. First of all, do you have a set writing schedule that you keep every day? I guess either of you can answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't. But I, what I, you know, I teach, so it changes every semester. But what I try to do is um, aim a little bit low, where um, instead of <laughs> no, instead of saying like, well, I'm going to write four hours a day, you know, five days a week, and then set myself up for failure, you know, I, I tend to say, well, maybe uh, twice a week. You know, uh, and, and then if I do three times a week, well, you yeah, know, then I'm exceeding. So, so I, so I try to have some kind of regularity, but it does shift from semester to semester. And I, and like I said, I do try to aim a little bit low, um, so that I can uh, get a lot of positive feedback when I exceed that. Okay. And then my second question is, uh, do you ever feel like, I guess, how often do you feel like your poems kind of get away from you? Like, how, how structured do you feel like? you stick, like come up with an idea and then stick to that, or does it end up as something completely different? I, I almost never really know where the poem's going to go. Um, I, I try to have, uh, the thing that makes me excited about writing is having a, a little snatch of language or an image that will give me a good first line, and that'll lead to a second line. That'll look. And then, of course, once you have two or three things, then you have interacting images and interacting rhythms, and then you're trying to modulate. So um, I, I very rarely try to plan anything out. The, yeah, yeah, rarely. And 
the times that you do, it fails. So. <laughs> we have time for one more question before we move into the open mic. Who has another question? Anybody? That's a question. I, I loved your poem about your friend who had cancer. Mm, it was just beautiful. And um, I noticed that you didn't give us any real backstory in your relationship with this person. Mm. And so this kind of distance, um, I thought, operated in kind of an, in an interesting mm. way. Can you talk a little bit about those comp that compositional choice? Mm. Well, that actually you know, had a lot of sort of real life elements. Uh, she was really more of a friend of my wife's. Um, than, than mine, although we were certainly friendly, and I mean, as, we as a couple were friends with them as a couple. They lived down the street, and so it was close enough to kind of observe some of that sort of uh, surge of care, you know, that sort of descended on them, you know, from church, from, uh, he, he used to teach in the philosophy department, and, and uh, she ran a nonprofit downtown, and so just, just to see the people that were showing up at the house, and, and it was a kind of a protracted illness, you know, and um, so um, so the distance in a way was sort of there already. It, it wasn't anything I had to kind of uh, think about too much, but it was a privileged distance because you're, yeah, I mean, if it, you know, if it was my grandmother or something dying, I mean, I couldn't have uh, sorted out, you know, yeah. any of that, that's some of that stuff that I tried to sort out at home, so. Great, thank you very much.